So welcome to Book Chat. I am Patricia Dubrow. I'm with Assisting Hands Home Care. And we offer many, many free community programs every month on Zoom. So I started with Assisting Hands um, almost three years ago. And I come from the world of arts and healing, hence the importance to me of having uh, free educational creative programs for our clients and our families and our colleagues. And I really like working with Steve Lorberbaum, the owner, because he gets it. He wants it to be easy for his families to understand what home care is and what it does and how it can improve the lives of family members who are um, being family caregivers. I mean, there's a difference between hiring a professional and hiring a lay person who may have been trained. And we want to make sure that both of those resources are being tapped to their best and not overwhelming either one. So um, it's been great working with families. Um, I had a, a daughter call me yesterday. Um, her dad went into the hospital or her mom has dementia. She can't be left home alone. Now everybody's scrambling to be with mom. And she called and we can help her with our dementia trained caregivers. So it's a good thing to know about, even if you don't think you're gonna need somebody anytime soon, I'd be happy to have a conversation with you and talk to you about how it works so that when it does come up, you'll sort of vaguely remember this conversation and feel a little better about the crisis you're in with your family. So let's, um, let me introduce our wonderful guest. And we have the summer picture here and the winter picture live. <laughs> <laughs> the great fortune of you, Amy. So Amy Freeman is a writer, an author, a poet, and she also happens to be um, the artistic director at the Writer Center in Bethesda. So how many of you are actually familiar with the Writer Center? It's been around since 1976 or 75, somewhere in there. And as a young art student, I had the privilege of being one of their first grantees through the NEA to create a um, artist book. In those days, artist books were unusual and the writer center had taken it on and we were using big old machines um, to do offset printing. And I loved every process of it. Um, I actually repurposed roof shingles that I had used at a, in a little house I built up in Vermont to make the plates that we then used on the machine to make the books. Uh, it's bizarre. I mean, I don't even remember how to do that anymore. But um, the Writer Center has grown astronomically since those days. It used to be in Glen Echo, and now it's in downtown Bethesda on Wall Street. And I'm going to um, let Amy give a little brief intro as to how she got involved with the Writer Center. and where her experience lies in there. So welcome, Amy. Um, so first of all, thank you very much for having me here. I really apologize for being in the car. And I was saying to someone when I realized that's how today was going to land, that I think that before the pandemic, this just would have been unthinkable. But at this point, you know, when I told you, Patricia, that's what was going to happen, you're like, yeah, okay, life. <laughs> so um, I am a writer. I work at the development as actually the development director at the Writer Center. Um, Why don't you tell us a little bit about you and your personal journey, and then we'll get into the Writer Center side. Sure. So um, I always wrote. Um, I think um, I'm not sure why there is a there is a, a, a block that people have, not a writer's block, in calling themselves a writer. Oh, there I am. Okay, people in calling themselves a writer. Um, there's a I'm not, I've written about this actually, that people have different um, levels of achievement that they need to consider themselves a writer. And I reject that. If you write, you're a writer. You don't need to um, win awards or publish books or even publish. If you want to write, you can write. You're a writer. So I always wrote. Um, I wrote journals. I was a lawyer. I won some awards for writing as a lawyer, and um, I wrote for some magazines, but I didn't take any of it seriously. Um, and then, um, actually, after I got divorced, after 20 years of marriage, I sort of thought, okay, who am I? Um, and 
as it turns out, I'm a writer. <laughs> um, so I was working at a place called Bethesda Cares, which is a group that um, works in homelessness, um, working with people suffering chronic, chronic homelessness in Montgomery County. Um, and I had a friend who um, oversaw the blogs at the Huffington Post, which you may know is a large online publication. And I, I experienced these just phenomenal moments because I didn't know anything about homelessness. Um, these phenomenal moments of just you know granular um, awareness of what it's like to suffer chronic homeless. And she said, you should write about it. Um, so I started writing about it. Um, and that turned into, so that was maybe, oh, you know, I was in my 40s. Yeah, late 40s before I started writing seriously. Um, and that led to my trying to publish in other places. Um, so while I was working at Bethesda Cares, um, one of the things that we learned about people suffering chronic, ho chronic homelessness is that once they're housed um, and they're not dealing with survival day to day, they get kind of bored. So while I was there, we created a program to um, have healthy, positive activities for people who had been living on the streets. So I thought, okay, let me figure out what's available. And I looked and I thought, oh, there's this place in Bethesda called the Writer's Center. That might be interesting. Great so, segue. Uh, right. So I reached out to the Writer's Center and we did have a program for people who had been homeless. It was really interesting. I can talk about that a lot too. Um, but um, when my boss stepped out at the writers at, at the Fast Cares, I was like, okay, I know where I'm going because it was just I just couldn't pivot to the new director. So when I joined the Writers Center, which was 2018, was when I realized what an incredibly vibrant literary community there is, not just in the greater DC area, but nationally, internationally. Um, but all this time I've been doing this on my own and, you know, trying to figure out how to get published, how to edit, how to do all these things I did on my own. And, it, you know, it worked okay, but oh my gosh, if I had had a Zoom like this, <laughs> it could have been so much easier. I just didn't know. Um, so that is the long-winded story of how I um, came to claim my, myself as a writer. That's great. So, so when you're writing now in those spare moments, um, what's your methodology? Do you do it in the morning? Are you more of like a binge writer? You, you set aside a week where you're just going to write. How do you put it into your day? Because you're a very busy lady. So, um, well, um, I mean, I have I honestly said for me, the pandemic has not been a creative time. Um, because my work, I do a lot of personal essays. I have a manuscript. I wrote a novel, a manuscript that I'm shopping to get published now, which is... Um, Everything I write is very, comes from somewhere very deep inside and it's um, usually pretty raw. And I, I, write, I write to understand myself. Um, and you know, sometimes it's sort of like just opening up a vein and bleeding on the page. And I would wake up in the early years of my later years of writing, I, I would wake up and just like sit and it was in the morning. I'd get up five, six in the morning and write, 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 write. It was all there ready to come out. But I have found that during the pandemic, um, I just, I haven't wanted to plumb the depths of my soul. You know, I feel like it's just so much more about, you know, coping with the day to day. Um, so what the only thing that has worked for me um, and, you know, schedules are, are I still, I, I prefer to write in the morning. I prefer to do everything in the morning. If, it, if it's nine o'clock, I'm done for the night. Um, what I found has worked somewhat is writing in other genres. So usually I write what's called a personal essay, which is uh, about an experience, which, which is what I was writing about homelessness. It's, it's nonfiction and it's usually tight to one subject. Um, and it, it, it tells something about yourself and, and some kind of transformation that happened. Um, so I've turned to other things. I've tried some, some satire. I tried some short short stories, and I'm terrible at short stories. Nobody will nobody will publish my short stories. Um, I have one beautiful poem, <laughs> but yeah, just uh, trying. And and when when all else fails, I just I journal. Because usually sure. when I have a book chat, there's actually a 
book about that we're talking about. But I brought you on specifically because I wanted to encourage people to write as a form of creative engagement. And I couldn't have prompted you to say it better. <laughs> so thank you. I mean, we, we make art to make ourselves feel better. We're really not about pleasing other people when we write. That's really not our goal when we're getting into that creative engagement. If it happens to do that, if it happens to be a social justice theme like homelessness or um, any you know environment, whatever, that's great. But really, as creators, we're we're working on our own insides, and by being truthful to that, it seems like it becomes very powerful statements. So well, you know, it's really. Sorry. No, I was going to go. Gonna... Go ahead. No, this is Zoom. We talk over each other and there are awkward breaks. We can't help it. Go ahead. I was going to ask you um, like how your role at the Writer Center helps you, in, you know, encourage people to write as well. Like what is it that you're actually doing with them and what kinds of fun things are coming up that we should know about um, with the Writer Center? Sure. So um, I, the, the one thing that I wanted to, to say when I was stepping on your speech, which I, for which I apologize, is that um, somebody said to me years ago, decades ago, that everybody should have a hobby at which you don't excel because it takes off the pressure. And so I paint and I'm not good, um, but I, I enjoy it. Um, so I think, you know, if, I think that you, you shouldn't hesitate to write just because you want to. You don't have to show it to anybody. You can. But um, it's it's about finding something inside of you and putting it in, putting it on paper. So uh, the Writer Center, uh, the Writer Center. Here's my dog and pony show. Is a literary arts nonprofit serving writers and people who want to write. We do this through 300 creative writing workshops each year, and we have a, a scholarship program, a low bar barrier scholarship program, which involves sending an email saying I need a scholarship, pretty much. Um, and um, we, so we have sort of three seasons of workshops across every genre and for uh, different abilities. Um, so as I said, about 300 a year, we have an incredible building in Bethesda, right near the Trader Joe's, between, right near, uh, uh, what is it, it's Bradley in Wisconsin, 12,000 square feet, uh, where, I mean, everything's virtual right now, but that's where we, we had some virtual classes, but now obviously we all. So when we go back in person, there will be some at the center, uh, but there will just, we're going to keep a bunch online. Uh, we also have events free that are free and open to the public, probably 80 to 100 a year. And those are super interesting, I think. Um, one thing that you can join um, anytime now um, is our virtual craft chats. So those are, um, and I'll, I'll send links to all of this afterwards. Um, these craft chats are about an hour long. There's one tomorrow or Thursday. I don't know. There's usually one each each week. And it's, it's talking with people not so much about what they wrote, but more about how they wrote it. It's about the craft of writing. And we, we try to make sure to cover uh, fiction, nonfiction, and poetry. Um, we also have, we have an in-house magazine. We publish Poet Lore, which is the oldest poetry journal in the country. Um, showcasing the finest in contemporary poets. We have a black box theater. Um, we do a lot. Um, I can go on about other programs that would have been in person, but maybe I'll hold off on that because, I mean, because some of the programming we did in person doesn't work online, we tried. Well, I know that the Writer Center does an exemplary job of, of supporting, encouraging, um, you know, writing can be a very lonely occupation. So it gives people a chance to get together. And this is also a wonderful opportunity. Uh, Ellie, who's on the call as well, and I are both part of the F. Scott Fitzgerald Literary Festival Committee. And the Writers' Center is a huge, huge connection for us for the festival. The partner. It's actually a partner. So for years, we've been having one of our events there. And they've been wonderful. So I know uh, we've enjoyed it. We've enjoyed it as well. Thank you. Yeah. It's such an important aspect of the festival and also for encouraging our short story adult uh, 
competition. Zach. And so, you know, Amy, you may not have found a publisher, but you may win oh, an award with the F. Scott uh, challenge. So you should put one of those oh. short stories in. Not saying there's any oh, prejudicial or anything, but. <laughs> The thing I'm trying to publish is, is the book. The other, st the other stuff I've had success publishing, but the book, the book, it's it just, I can talk about how to publish books if people want, but it's a long, long darn process. Well, I, I had, I had to... a funny, sorry. No, go ahead. I've served as a judge for, for the F. Scott Fitzgerald contest. And I had a funny experience. I was reading um, the high school submissions. I was like, wow, these are good. And then I got to one and I thought, gosh, this sounds a lot like somebody, something I heard somebody else read. And I thought, I'm gonna just destroy this person's career because this is, I think this is plagiarized. This kid's gonna, you know, so I, I sent the, the essay, took the, the names weren't on it. And I sent the, essay, the short story to the person I thought had been plagiarized. And she said, that's mine. <laughs> I wasn't reading the high school stuff. I, they'd sent me the adult by mistake. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Uh, yeah. I was, so, if, if that was high school writing, I was, I was impressed. <laughs> that's, yeah. Well, I'll tell you, we have heard some amazing high school short stories, actually really amazing. Um, so one of the, well, there's a couple of people online here who have published books and um, Sherry was asking if you would talk a little bit more about the publishing part. So if you want to give your, five minutes of that one, that would be great. Absolutely, so I think I can see the chat. Okay, there we go. Uh, publishing, okay, so publishing, uh, there are different, there's publishing poems, short stories, uh, personal essays. Um, so what I'm gonna say now about publishing goes specifically to publishing a book that is not poetry. Um, so, and then there are two different ways of approaching books that are um, nonfiction and fiction and memoir is kind of neither fish nor fowl. So, okay, there are four uh, ways to publish a book and I'm going to list them um, in order of difficulty of getting it done, I guess I'll say. Uh, so the first, the first is traditional publishing. And I think that there are now the big three. I think that there are three publishers, Macmillan, Hachette, I don't know, the ones you've heard of. I forget, Penguin, I forget who's, a who, who's still standing. They've just been merging and merging in the last couple of years. Now, to get to one of those publishers, you need a literary agent. To get a literary agent, you need to send what's called a query letter. I mean, there are other ways of getting agents, but this is the traditional, this is like the, the most common way, which means you send the letter, an email. Um, whoops, okay, so I just saw the chat pop up. Yeah, and just, you go, you go, yep, I'm writing you go what into you what, say. Yeah, I can, I can also just repeat all this. Um, okay, okay. so. Um, We lost your sound, Amy. That's because I stuck my thumb over the mute button. <laughs> Refresh. Um, so when you when you when you look for an agent, they will tell you on their websites exactly what they want to publish or they want to they want to uh, acquire, and how what they want to hear from you. Do they want five pages? Do they want a synopsis? Do they want ten pages? So you submit and then you wait and 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 maybe after six months, someone will write back and say. I'd like to see 25 pages, or I'd like to see the whole thing. And then you wait and you wait and you wait and you wait um, because they get hundreds a week, hundreds a week. Um, but that said, it's called the slush pile. Um, I know multiple slush pile successes. Uh, it's, it's, it's a legitimate way of getting an agent and then they shop it to the publisher. Okay, so that's the first way. Uh, and these are not in order of preference, and I'll explain that. In a, so the second uh, type is, it's called small presses. They used to be called independent presses, but that's being taken by self-publishers. So um, small presses aren't necessarily that small. They're just not the big three. Um, some of them will only take agented submissions, but some of them 
you can submit directly, um, either through an open submission um, session or through a contest. And again, you know, you submit and then you wait and you wait and you wait. And it makes sense because they have to read your book and they, you're reading books. <laughs> it's time consuming. Um, so small presses don't have the um, clout that the larger ones do, but you have a, you get a lot more attention and a lot more um, autonomy and decision making. Um, next down, I'll say that are hybrid publishers, which are, um, you submit directly to them. In, in the first two, they pay you. They pay you in advance and then you get royalties. In a hybrid publisher, um, it's, it's a form of self-publishing, but it's curated self-publishing. So um, you submit and you have to get accepted, but you're going to front the money for the publication. And they do not have the distribution um, that, the, that the larger presses do. But I know somebody who did quite well with it, so it's a legit option. And then the self-publishing, which perhaps the person who posted can talk more about than I can, but that's where you, you pay and you, you – um, Amazon has – I think, of course, Amazon have, has everything. Um, but you pay and you, pub, you, you design, you publish. You can get that done in a matter of weeks. Um, you decide how many copies you want and have it, and then, but you're also in charge of, I mean, you're in charge of, you, you have a lot of marketing to do regardless. They're going to, everybody wants you to promote your own stuff. But um, I think that the, the most important thing that I've learned about these four options isn't that one is, is better. It's, it depends what you want. Like, are you, do you want to put out 50 copies and of, of your family history and give that to your family? Do you want, do you, do you want the big book tour? I mean, it, it depends. You have to really ask yourself what you want before you invest all this time and effort and possibly money in publishing. That's a great, okay, that, question was a great one, that was a great one to four options. I mean, that kind of spells it out pretty clearly. Um, yeah, no, I, I mean, this is, I, I love, I love having this conversation with people because I had to figure all that on my own. So right. if I can short so, circuit it. My dad retired um, from the feds and started his own consulting business, but he channeled a book. I mean, he literally just, like you were saying, it was just coming out of him every single day. And then he shopped it. This was, you know, oh, 25 years ago. Then he you know, sent it out to agents. He sent it out to publishers. He kept getting rejections, rejections, rejections. And then he had a major stroke. And my sister, who had helped other people in the past, also a lawyer writer um, with publishing, said, you know what? I hear that you can do this self-published thing on Amazon. This was in the early days. And so she took it on. And she really followed their step-by-step -step guide, you know, just like a lawyer, you know, she follows the direction. And she um, got his book published, and then we, um, you know, we had we got well enough to do a very rudimentary signing, and then between she and I, we promoted the book, and um, it was really an interesting experience. So I can understand it takes a lot of passion and commitment to do that. From the other authors that I hear on book chat even, and those that I've met through the festival, you know, even with an agent, there is so much work to do. I mean, they, oh, I, can't, yes. I can't say enough how you underscore, and I know Irene's going to want to speak to this, so go ahead. Yeah, so um, I, everything you're saying is just so helpful, Amy, um, I, and actually, almost exactly a year ago, I self-published a book, and what I did find, <laughs> so, and then, congratulations. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I've been working Tell on the, the book. title because it's worth hearing. Oh, uh, Care and Feeding of the Aging Human Male Species, a Sassy Primer. So some people, women consider it uh, nonfiction, men consider it fiction, but it's how to get along <laughs> with your, your, your old relationship with your old man. Okay. And it also has a lot about sisterhood in it. Um, so I worked on it um, for three years, the last year during the pandemic. And I'm, I don't know what the normal self-publishing -publish, process is or process, you know, or having someone else publish you is, but 
Um, everything changed in uh, 2020 in terms of the pandemic. Um, over a million books were published last year. And um, I've seen a number of articles written about how the only people who are really selling now are people like John Grisham and Danielle Steele. And if you sell a thousand books, it's considered excellent just because the competition is, is just amazing. And um, my experience was um, I decided to self-publish because when I first looked into publishing and I, uh, I uh, went to a couple consultants, they said, you know, it's almost impossible with the volume that's being published to get, to get even, um, people to read your book for a year or two, okay? I mean, the, there's just an astronomical number of books out there and an astronomical books, you know, trying to get sold. And um, so I went ahead and did the self-publishing and I found um, it was an amazingly wonderful experience. Um, and uh, one of the best resources that I, and, and a, a good friend of mine's daughter had just self-published her book and she was an amazing resource. Um, now she's a lawyer so, and she had some spare time. She did it with like a thousand dollars and it's it's wonderful. She's it's, It was a book about her grandmother who was a, a female pilot in World War II um, uh, training male pilots. Um, but what I found was I, um, she recommended I go to readsy.com, R-E-E-D-S-Y.com. That's how I found my um, person to do the book cover. That's how I found my person to do the topography. That's how I found my illustrator. And then um, that's how also how I found, and my daughter helped me find an editor. And um, it was wonderful having a team like that help me. It was such an amazing experience. And I, I a lot of my team I still keep in contact with and, and they're still friends, but it really takes a lot of drive to start with the, what you think is the finished book and get it to the place where it's published. And the whole social media and media thing is a whole other issue. I mean, I ended up by hiring and firing six different people to help me with media and social media because part of the reason was I'm older, I'm not conversant in social media and my target audience was women over 50. But um, so I just went right to the self-publishing and, and what you said, Amy, was true. I felt like I really wrote the book for myself. I mean, I really changed at, in becoming an author and I also changed in the content of the book. Like I felt like I learned a lot from my friends and their older men they were with. And I also felt like I was, I would wake up at three in the morning channeling my mothers and my grandmothers. So it was, if it, and I felt like if I never sold one book, it was worth it. It was an amazing experience for me. I'm gonna pause you right there because we're almost at the end of our show. Sorry. That's okay. So I wanted to know if anybody else had any questions for Amy. If Amy, you're okay to stay on a little bit, we can go a little longer. I just didn't wanna oh, crunch everybody. Absolutely, absolutely. And okay. uh, you're welcome to put my email in the chat. The, one of the yeah, questions so from Sherry is, um, is there pretty much no interest in poetry that's rhymed these days? I don't know. I would say probably, I, I actually don't know anything about whether or not it matters if you rhyme. I will say Amanda Gorman at the Biden's inauguration sparked a huge interest uh, in poetry. I know a lot of it tends to be, a lot of what I see um, tends to be experimental. And yeah, I think that there is and take this with a salt shaker, not just a grain of salt, but a salt shaker, because poetry isn't my jam, uh, although I did write that one. Um, um, I, I think that there is uh, an unfair um, idea that that rhyming is, is outdated. I do think that, yeah. But if you call it rap, then rhyming works just fine, so. Right, spoken word, exactly. Yep, so I would, I would say go for it, Sherry, start the trend. Always write what you want. Write what you want. Write what you want. Don't write for yourself, and and then and then then email me, and we'll figure out where to place it. So um, Sherry is saying um, she's gotten radio interviews all over the world. How does that help with marketing? And obviously, the more you get it out there, I'm in marketing. That's my field. So the more you get it out there, the more there is the isness of you around the world. The more people are going to pay attention. She said she wrote over 3,000 poems in the last year and a half, and wow. she's passionate about poetry writing, clearly. Um, I think she's from Australia or New Zealand. Sherry's been on many times with us. Um, she's published in over 50 journals, and she's a haiku poet. 
um, and it is New Zealand. And I'm so glad you're here, Sherry, and I hope everything's going well in New Zealand and you guys are staying safe. Um, Haiku is such a fabulous vehicle for writing. We hosted um, Phyllis Levinson I, I and um, she did Haiku for Coaching. Very interesting book of poetry. So. Um, yeah, I mean, poetry, poetry is a whole different, publishing poetry is, uh, sounds like you can, somebody else can speak more to this than I can, but it's a whole different uh, universe. But I, I just want to share two things. One is um, I will email, or I, we've created a, um, a discount code of 5% 5 5 off our workshops, if you want, for AH, assisting hands, AH 2022. So if you go to our website and that's class you want to take, uh, you can use that. Um, I just quickly wanted to mention to Sherry that I did reach out in terms of radio interviews in my book, and I found that they were quite expensive to get people to do podcast interviews and radio interviews. And I was I couldn't get um, specific statistics on the um, return on investment. They weren't really sure how many people were listening to the interviews, and they had no statistics on how many actual sales resent, re, resulted from the interviews. So I, I never got involved. But there are people out there, um, you know, that in, in your specific genre, I mean, really specific that are that you might want to talk to. I also wanted to mention that we had Kim Truitt on Book Chat, who did um, haikus based on Al Gore's An Inconvenient Truth. And he hasn't published it yet, but he's got, he used photographs and haiku because he felt like one of the biggest problems with Al Gore's Inconvenient Truth is that it was just too long and people yeah. lost interest. And so therefore we have, you know, global warming times the thousand. So sometimes it's better to say small things short and clear and run with it that way. Ellie, you want the last word? What sage wisdom do you have uh, well, today? My, my, my two books are published by um, academic presses and that's something you, you're not addressing really at the Writers' Center, but that's a whole different thing where you have a contract first, you know, you have an interest and you have a sample and you have a promise <laughs> and you have editorial help, huge editorial help. And I'm wondering if, People who publish their own work have good editors, really good grammarians and, um, you know, people with vision to help you the way in an academic press, for example, you have. I did mean to, to specify that not just for academic presses, but for nonfiction in general, for fiction, for a novel, you submit the, the finished manuscript. For nonfiction, they want a proposal. They want to know you have the credibility to pull it off. They want a proposal, not the manuscript. Um, that's right. So that, that's right. Yeah, that's and memoir is, as I said, not a fish nor fowl. I have seen people who want the finished memoir, and I've seen people who want the proposal. So that's still being being thrashed out there. This okay. was a great interactive book chat today. I so appreciate all of your comments and stories. This is what building community is about when we are not able to see each other. So thank you for parking your car, Amy. I hope you're. Thank you for tolerating me sitting in my car. I really appreciate it. And I was like, okay, well, we're, like I said, I think two years ago, um, people would be in, you know, insulted. But I think that now people understand that life is messy and we're all going in different directions that we didn't mean to. And yeah. But we've learned so much and we make it adaptable. I think that's um, the human nature, right? We adapt and um, we certainly have pivoted with the festival. We've done it twice now on Zoom. We're right. crossing our fingers for October live at the Universal Unitarian Congregation in Rockville. And um, it's a future powers. Site. I was just going to say it's a perfect <laughs> site for our ho for our honoree this year, Richard Powers, who wrote the amazing environmental book um, Overstory. The sanctuary is three walls of glass. It is gorgeous. So it's going to be glass looking out on trees, talking to each other while Richard Powers talks to us. But thank you all for being here. If you have questions or concerns, you want to talk to Amy, she can, you can find her at the Writers' Center. You want to talk to me, you can find me at Assisting Hands Home Care. And we look forward to next month's book chat. Thanks, everybody. Bye.